Hello, everyone, and welcome. Uh, this is the Invasive Species Program Update session of the Ontario Invasive Species Forum. Thank you so much for joining us today. We've got three great speakers that are going to be joining us. Um, before we get started, uh, my name is Lauren Bell. I'm, I work at the Invasive Species Centre, and I'm going to be today's moderator for this session. As we go along, uh, please just note the question box on the side panel uh, of your um, display here and you can add any questions as we go along and please feel free to um, add them throughout the presentation. We're not going to be doing questions at the end of every presentation but we'll have a session at the end uh, where we can address some of those questions for all the speakers. So thank you again for, for joining us today. Uh, we're just going to hop right into it. Uh, our first speaker today is Colin Hanine. Colin is the Senior Policy Advisor in the Marine Policy and Transport Canada based in Ottawa. He has been Canada's ballast water policy lead since 2010, working closely with colleagues from Transport Canada Marine Safety and Security, Fisheries and Oceans Canada, and Global Affairs Canada, amongst others. During that time, Colin has represented Canada in domestic, binational, and international ballast water discussions. Colin holds a bachelor's degree in computer science and a PhD in cognitive science. Colin is also a community radio broadcaster and chairs the Board Governance Committee for MASC, an Ottawa organization that promotes the arts in schools and the community. So thank you so much, Colin, for joining us today. Just going to make you the presenter and you can take it away. Okay, well, good morning, everybody. Um, very happy to be here today. Um, and thanks, Lauren, for that introduction. Uh, I am just going to see if um, the powers that be are with us this morning in terms of sharing my presentation. Um, and I'm hopeful that everybody can see that uh, here this morning. I'm just going to minimize all of you so that I can actually see my presentation myself. Um, so good morning everybody. Um, yes, I work for Transport Canada. I work in the Marine Policy Group um, and I've been working on ballast water issues for about 10 years now. Um, the, uh, the, the presentation that I'm going to give you this morning uh, is going to touch on um, a few different things. We're going to talk about ships, um, ballast water and the International Convention. We're going to talk about who should be managing their ballast water, what standards should be met, uh, when vessels should comply, and we're going to talk about our Transport Canada regulatory timeline. Um, and I'm going to focus mostly on Great Lakes um, because this is an Ontario Invasive Species Centre presentation, but also because many of the issues um, around ballast water from a Canadian perspective have been most acute on the Great Lakes. So, uh, so without further ado, um, uh, I'm not going to spend too much time at the beginning here talking about invasive species, um, uh, but obviously it's a major threat to global bio biodiversity. We have significant environmental and economic impacts uh, associated with it. And the Great Lakes, of course, being one of the areas where um, invasive species have been particularly challenging in terms of those impacts. Um, but I will talk a little bit more about ballast water in case folks are not um, as familiar with ballast water. Um, so ships uh, inadvertently fa uh, facilitate the movement of species um, as they go about their business. And you can see uh, at the top right that uh, shipping is a major way that species can be transported long distances and introduced into new aquatic ecosystems. Um, and you see the dark, dark red color that is um, uh, uh, between Europe and North America, and that includes going on to the Great Lakes and into the St. Lawrence River Basin, and as well um, port networks uh, on Canada's west coast, um, in other places. So uh, this is a, a, a main uh, route for the introduction and spread of invasive species. Um, ships need to use ballast water um, for safety and stability. So looking at the little pictures at the bottom of this slide, you can see that you know when the, the vessel is starting perhaps at a at a source port from the perspective of the species, um, 
you know, the, the ballast water is loaded um, when the ship is discharging its cargo. So it offsets the weight of the cargo, which is lightning, by bringing more ballast water into the tank to keep the ship operating at a safe level. Obviously, when they bring that um, ballast water on board the ship, you get plants and animals that are entrained. And then, um, you know, during the voyage, um, the ship is sailing with a, an empty cargo hold, but full ballast tanks. And when it gets to the destination port, the ballast water is discharged when new cargo is taken on board. And, um, and that is the point of, uh, of, of transportation or introduction, depending on your terminology preference, um, of, the, uh, of, the, of the invasive species into the receiving port waters. And it's important to note that, um, you, you know, this risk doesn't diminish uh, with time because, you know, first of all, we, we, we all know that you, know, you can have range expansion depending on things like changing climate, but we also have shipping routes that are constantly changing and the ships themselves are going between different ports um, as, they, as they do their business. At the bottom left is a, a, a little tiny little worker there inside a very large ballast tank of a Great Lakes vessel. So you can see there's a lot of space available on some of these big ships um, to bring on water and therefore uh, the species that are in that water. So we have a history of leadership in promoting ballast water management um, uh, to advance both um, environmental outcomes and economic outcomes. Um, we uh, have had regulations since 2006, but domestic ships have remained exempt. Um, what happened is uh, leading up to 2004, and since 2004, we've been very involved in driving development of uh, an international convention on ballast water. We came party to the convention in 2010. It applies to all ships trading internationally, including on the Great Lakes, um, as well as to domestic ships that, that risk uh, spreading invasive species um, within Canadian waters, or say, let's say Canadian and US waters on the Great Lakes. So what the convention requires is for ships to fit ballast water management systems uh, to limit the number of viable organisms they discharge. So um, I like to tell people that this is sort of pool filtration technology. Actually, it's scaled up significantly. So it's sort of wastewater treatment technology, but you can look at filtration and chlorination, for example. UV is another big way that people are looking at this um, in fresh water. And it's a fairly significant installation for the vessel. Um, it's very expensive to put these systems on. They often how we'll have to uh, make major structural changes to the engine room in order to accommodate um, uh, the equipment, which is fairly large in order to make this work out. So in 2019, um, we, in, in response to the need for regulatory amendments to give effect to the, this international convention in Canada, we propose draft regulations. Um, they're intended to uh, reduce the environmental and economic risks from the introduction and spread of invasive species, give effect to our obligations, maximize compatibility with a differing approach in the United States, which has been particularly challenging. Um, and also mitigate technical uncertainty that, um, that we face um, with this equipment, notably in the Great Lakes St. Lawrence River region. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a, middle, in a minute. So we're gonna talk now about the who of managing ballast water, the what in terms of what they need to do and the when in terms of where they're gonna do it. So we're gonna start with the who. So again, focusing on the Great Lakes, um, we have a number of different voyage patterns of vessels that are operating on the Great Lakes. So this blue arrow would be ships moving ballast water um, between US ports. Uh, the red arrow would be ships moving ballast water between Canadian ports. The purple arrow is showing that we have a cross lakes trade between Canada and the US. And the green arrow is showing that we do have some, um, some ballast water that is brought in from overseas. All of these voyage patterns pose risks to um, the shared natural resources in this region. Uh, what we can do in Canada with respect to our regulations is deal with the ships that load or unload ballast water in Canada. So we can essentially um, regulate the red arrow, the purple arrow, and the green arrow. The blue arrow um, is a domestic movement by U.S. ships, and it's more effective for the U.S. Uh, to regulate those vessels. Um, and they're, as I said, uh, operating on a slightly different timeline and with uh, a slightly different mandates for their departments because they're not parties to the convention. 
So why should Great Lakes ships manage ballast water? Um, we often have the question, you know, what difference does it make? Uh, these ships are all operating in the same environmental region. And, uh, you know, what's, what's the big deal here? Um, we're we should focus more on the international vessels and not worry too much about the domestic ships. So just a few um, uh, bullets there on risk. Um, we know that there are at least five unique ecoregions um, in the Great Lakes with uh, distinct biodiversity communities and uh, species, uh, species endemism. Um, we know that, uh, that Great Lakes ships transport the vast majority of ballast water on the Great Lakes, making a highly interconnected network of ports. Um, we know that uh, when species are moved in ballast water, it's over long distances on the Great Lakes that are hard to reach by natural dispersal, and that species um, may be introduced to places where they're not already present. Uh, we know when we look at, at, at the international vessels that, that have to take some actions to manage their ballast water and will be taking more, whereas the domestic ships are not managing their ballast water today, that um, uh, that, that leads to a high risk of successful introductions for uh, Great Lakes vessels relative to the international vessels. And we know that moving to ballast water treatment would dramatically reduce the transportation of organisms by all ships. So that's the who. So in terms of the what, um, so we know that Great Lakes ship owners are concerned that regional factors uh, make ballast water treatment very, very difficult on the Great Lakes. We have very cold water, um, which, which, which challenges um, chemical treatment. Uh, we have fresh water, obviously, um, which uh, rules out the use of some technologies that uh, electrolyze um, sanitizers from uh, seawater. Uh, we know that uh, filtration can pose uh, some challenges here. Uh, this lovely uh, satellite image uh, from the US uh, shows the blue silt deposits that can be stirred up after storms on the Great Lakes. So it is a very difficult area and part of the world in order to do ballast water treatment. Um, Fisheries and Oceans Canada has been out there doing some sampling and we find that um, the systems are greatly lowering the risks. Um, they may be meeting standards uh, only around 50% of the time right now, but performance is expected to keep improving and they're dramatically lowering the number of organisms in their ballast water. So even if they're not always hitting the standard, um, they're, they're dropping the dose of organisms dramatically uh, along the way. Uh, and we've proposed that international ships continue to exchange and treat ballast water when they're going to the Great Lakes and other Canadian freshwater ports to maximize protections there. In terms of uh, expected outcomes of uh, this approach, um, given where the technology is at today, uh, again, DFO has been modeling this, uh, looking at the efficacy of ballast water treatment um, on the Great Lakes and uh, what we're assuming here is that international ships are treating, but we're looking at different patterns of domestic ships treatment. And so the main findings are that at current levels of performance, um, we would reduce annual zooplankton establishments in the Great Lakes by 82% if we went ahead with this technology. Um, and uh, you know, as the technology improves and becomes more reliable, we would scale up to 99% um, uh, reduction in establishments by ballast water, and this is at Canadian Great Lakes ports. If you want to affect U.S. Great Lakes ports, then you need to have the U.S. regulating their blue line ships along the way. So in terms of the compliance timelines uh, now and when ships would comply, so the international vessels are currently transitioning to the use of ballast water management systems on board their vessels between 2019 and 2024. So that, um, that is part of the way along. Uh, we have proposed that Great Lakes vessels um, comply by 2024 to allow them uh, a little bit more time to select, pilot and install their systems because they need to comply with the convention and because the US rules have been in flux. So this has been our proposal in our draft regulations, international ships between 2019 and 2024, um, Great Lakes vessels that operate in Canada get the job by 2024. Uh, we have uh, received quite a bit of public comment on this and feedback from industry and from uh, US agencies as well on the challenges for Great Lakes ships that are really specific to the Great Lakes. Um, you know, there's a big learning curve, as I mentioned, with using this technology. Also, you know, we've 
got a relatively high concentration of ships in a small area where finding necessary personnel to do these installations is a challenge and obviously seeking some time to increase binational compatibility. So where things stand right now is that we're proposing a binational discussion of timelines and we're proposing that we do this for new ships, recently constructed ships and older Great Lakes ships. Recognizing that the old ships here are the ones that face the biggest challenges because they were built before, you know, if you want to think of an era of ballast water management, whereas some of the more recently constructed vessels have um, have uh, uh, have been designed to receive ballast water treatment systems. So we're still thinking about our regulatory process here, um, but a decision is expected in the coming months. And specifically, um, our timeline is, uh, so we published our draft regulations back in 2019. We accepted public comments um, from June 2019 to September 2019. And we're now in a situation where we're, um, we're, we're working towards a spring 2021 date for finalization of ballast water regulations in the Canada Gazette Part 2. So you can look for an announcement on that coming in the spring. And with that, um, I believe the plan is to hold questions until the end of the session. Um, so, but I'll be happy to, uh, happy to take any questions uh, at the end of the session. Um, and uh, if you want to uh, have a quick screenshot and you want to send me an email uh, in terms of getting any further information on uh, any of the things I've talked about today, including the most recent DFO science, uh, then uh, please don't hesitate to reach out and do that. And with that, um, I will pass it back and uh, look forward to hearing from my co-presenters here on the panel this morning. Great. Thanks so much, Colin. Um, I'll put everyone's uh information in the chat box as well so you have contact info for all the speakers too. Um, so uh, next up our next speaker uh, is Kathy Giesbrecht. Kathy is currently a team lead in the Environmental Policy Office at the Ontario Ministry of Transportation. Kathy joined the policy office in November and is a member of MTO's Vegetation Management Working Group which supports MTO's efforts to address invasive Phragmites and includes representatives from the Ministry's Maintenance Management Office and Regional Highway Operations Maintenance Coordinators from across the province. Kathy's home position is Head of Environmental Delivery Section in MTO's London office, where she has been supporting MTO's Phragmites efforts in southwestern Ontario for several years. So I'm going to pass over screen controls to Kathy and you can take it away. Thanks, Lauren. So showing my screen, can you see that yes, there? Okay, great. All right, so uh, thanks for the opportunity to present to the forum today. Um, as Lauren noted, I recently joined MTO's Environmental Policy Office. So I'm definitely on a learning curve uh, about Frank Mighty's management and how MTO's various offices uh, and contractors are working together. So my presentation today is focusing on invasive Phragmites, and I'm going to talk about impacts of Phragmites on MTO's highways, MTO's efforts to manage it. Uh, I want to recognize our external partners in, in these efforts. Uh, I'll go into a bit more detail about three of the components of MTO's strategy. And finally, um, highlight a case study, a native tall grass prairie project. So in terms of invasive Phragmites, it impacts provincial highways through increased maintenance costs uh, due to damage to the highway infrastructure. It impacts drainage, um, filling in ditches and blocking the ends of culverts. And if water cannot drain from the road, um, and that's not just the service, but the underlying um, uh, materials, it, it impacts the life cycle of the road. Uh, Phragmites restricts sight lines for drivers it's a fire hazard, and it impedes construction and maintenance activities. Um, MTO's ability to control the spread of Phragmites is restricted to MTO's right-of-way, and as we're all aware, uh, Phragmites does not recognize property boundaries. MTO is looking at an integrated approach to Phragmites management that combines several actions. Uh, the first is, is collaboration. Uh, MTO is part of an interministerial working group, on invasive species led by MNRF. And we learned what other ministries are doing and what MTO can contribute. 
so collaborating with other provincial ministries. Uh, the second is providing guidance to contractors working on MTO highways, both maintenance and construction contractors, which I'll talk a bit more about in a couple of slides. Um, the third part is a coordinated approach that has many components, which are still evolving, and, and they vary from site to site and region to region, uh, depending on local conditions um, and, and the highway. You know, how we address Phragmites along a two-lane rural highway versus along a four-lane, six-lane freeway, uh, some with a median, some without. So this includes, you know, inventorying and monitoring of Phragmites, determining what is native, what is invasive, and where it is. Um, and this is important for developing a program that includes mechanical control, so mowing, which is a temporary measure, and, and may need to be repeated several times during the growing season, uh, cutting or brushing, which is usually done after spraying to cut the treated stands, uh, making it easier to see how successful the spraying has been, to give better access for follow-up spraying. Uh, there's the chemical control herbicide spraying, usually midsummer, early fall, and it, you know, it varies by the part of the province and the conditions. There's usually some monitoring after spraying to see how it worked, and then also monitoring after cutting to see what is growing back. Our current approach is sites need herbicide spraying for sort of, we're looking at three successive years uh, to keep treating it, otherwise it will grow back. Um, and as you're all aware, our management efforts are limited by lack of registered herbicides for use over water. So in your efforts to manage Phragmites along linear highway transportation corridors may include you know, spraying along sections of the right of way separated by water courses where there is Phragmites. So it's difficult to prevent uh, reinfestations. Um, you know, the final component is monitoring the effectiveness of control methods, and that's partly our mapping, and also you know, learning from our experiences and adjusting our approach and then staying connected internally and externally about what's working and not, and, and then continuing to adjust. I want to give a shout out to MTO's external partners who are also involved in Phragmites management efforts. And just to name a few, the Ontario Invasive Plant Councils, Ontario Phragmites Working Group, uh, Nature Conservancy of Canada, Georgian Bay Forever, um, MTO's West Region Maintenance Office, um, has worked with the NCC, Nature Conservancy of Canada, in two locations, um, Big Creek Watershed in the Bruce Peninsula. Uh, so for two years, MTO, the maintenance staff worked in concert with NCC, who are leading the effort to treat all the Phragmites in those locations on both public and private lands. So this partnership is a significant benefit to MTO's efforts as NCC makes contact with adjacent landowners and makes arrangements to treat Phragmites where it extends beyond MTO property, um, helping to prevent uh, reinfestations. Uh, you know, working with our partners includes sharing information about what sections of highway have been treated, coordinating treatment efforts inside and outside the right of way, uh, learning from each other and participating in meetings and forums like this one. I also uh, want to note that MTO funded uh, research projects by McMaster University. Um, some of their research led by uh, Dr. Patricia Chow-Fraser is complete and, and the reports are available through MTO's online library. Um, some research led by uh, Dr. Susan Dudley, uh, we're just waiting for the final report and then it will also get uploaded to MTO's online library. Um, if I have a few minutes at the end, I can show some slides about their research. Uh, in addition to developing strategy for MTO maintenance offices, we're also incorporating Phragmites management into more of our uh, major construction contracts. Uh, this includes coordinating Phragmites spraying prior to the contracts, so the contractors aren't having to work through large uh, Phragmites stands and there's less opportunity for Phragmites to get inadvertently moved elsewhere. And I'll expand a bit on this on the next slide. And then just at the bottom here, you can see some, so far the West Region um, Maintenance Office uh, 2019 and 2020, 
these are the highways that were treated um, with the approximate area of treatment and, and the cost. And that would, was just for the one uh, region southwest. Uh, so this is for construction contracts, new specifications for the contracts to provide consistent direction for cutting and or spraying invasive phragmites. Uh, the next part is important to note, we're working on direction for contractors on how to manage excess soil containing phragmites. Uh, this is becoming more of a challenge as under Ontario Regulation 406.19, on-site and excess soil management. Uh, disposal of excess soil at landfills will not be allowed effective January 1st, 2025. Uh, landfills sites are already refusing to accept excess soil containing invasive phragmites, uh, so landfill disposal is not always viable. So MTO is considering how to manage this material within the highway right-of-way where possible or off-site treatment or management uh, to minimize the amount um, going to landfill. So this uh, will require, um, you know, concerted focus over the next few years, uh, figuring out options to manage excess soil containing this uh, invasive phragmites. Oh, we're also working on an MTO phragmites best management practices guide for MTO staff, consultants, and contractors uh, during highway design, construction, operation, and maintenance and it's continuing to evolve as we learn more. Uh, we're also looking at more use of native seed mixes for various benefits, including hopefully out-competing phragmites, and also for help to capture and hold drifting snow. Uh, tall grass prairie uh, plant species have deep roots. Many are drought and salt tolerant, and they seem to be able to either, whether it's out-compete or prevent phragmites from moving in. So that's something we're exploring more. Uh, this slide's about a partnership project with MNRF and the Rural Lambton Stewardship Network uh, to naturalize about 38 kilometers of the Highway 40 right-of-way uh, between Walsburg and Sarnia. Uh, MTO provided parcels of surplus land within the wider right-of-way uh, for this greening initiative to reestablish native tall grass prairie after about 12 years, there is very little phragmites on this section of highway. So uh, once again, I wanna thank you for the opportunity to present and, and can respond to questions. I'll just quickly, the appendix um, shows some of the um, spraying treatment that was done in West Region um, for herbicide between, so these are showing the different highways, 2016, 17, 18, 19 and then 2020 last year and so you know some of the sections it's a follow-up treatment sort of that two three year program other ones we're expanding new into spray and treat and then finally this is just a bit about the funded research from McMaster University that used um, remote sensing or ortho imagery to identify you know where phragmites is how much is it expanding where has treatment been successful? So that's some research if you're interested in following up. And then the one by Dr. Susan Dudley is looking at, you know, how resilient native seeds are against invasive phragmites. And we're hoping to uh, get that posted to MTO's library later this year. And that's it. Back to you, Lauren. Thank you so much, Kathy. Just going to share my screen. Great. Okay, so our next speaker is Denise Beaton. Denise is the Crop Protection Specialist at the Ontario Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. In this role, she helps coordinate efforts to develop strategic approaches to invasive species issues that can impact Ontario agriculture and trade. She works closely with various stakeholders, such as industry and government partners, researchers, and her OMAFRA colleagues. She enjoys getting out in the field as much as possible to help monitor for agricultural pests. I'm just going to make you the presenter, and then you can take it away, Denise. Okay, 
just gonna see what you can see. Okay, awesome. Okay, so thanks Lauren and good morning everyone. And thank you to the Invasive Species Center for the invitation to speak. Um, so far, it's been a really great um, forum. I've really enjoyed it. And uh, I just want to go over briefly what we do in the agriculture development branch that I work under at OMAFRA as far as from a plant health perspective, so which includes address, addressing invasive species, just in case you're not familiar with what we do. So OMAFRA's role, um, in OMAFRA's role, we do a lot of pest monitoring for endemic and new invasive pests. We develop um, integrated pest management programs and we're continuously revising those and we educate growers on IPM practices. We do applied research projects and on-farm demonstration trials. We um, do a lot of extension efforts. We develop um, crop protection guides, apps. We do a lot of writing on our various commodity blogs. Um, we update our website content all the time and we organize and um, present at various workshops and conferences. We do have funding for IPM research through our Ontario Agri-Food Innovation Alliance, um, which was previously called the OMAFRA University of Guelph Partnership. We also have a plant health theme under the um, Canadian Agricultural Partnership Funding Program. And we try to participate on various national and international working groups that involve invasive species. Um, we also have a minor use program in Canada, and we're pretty involved with that. Um, so this program um, brings pest control products to Canadian minor crop and specialty crop growers that otherwise might not be able to, that otherwise it, um, these products might not be marketed to them because they're unique and or limited production area. So this program is a great collaborative effort of many governments, um, the feds and provinces, um, pest control companies, um, researchers, and grower groups. And so um, one of the 2021 minor use priorities is identification and registration of effective pest control products for new invasive species, um, such as box tree moth, um, tomato leaf miner, Phragmites, and spotted lanternfly. <clears throat> we can also pursue emergency use registrations in cases um, <clears throat> Or there is new emerging pest issues, such as a new introduction of an invasive species, and where there's no um, currently registered options. Um, we also have the Ontario Critical Plant Pest Management Council. And Kara Grant from CFI mentioned this council yesterday during the Asia Monghorn Beetle session. So it's a committee of senior officials and um, within which um, critical plant pest issues are considered and collaborative approaches are developed in keeping with the legislative mandates of the participants. So they've all um, signed a um, memorandum of uh, understanding and there's membership from CFIA, OMAFRA, MNRF, um, Canadian Forest Services and Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada. And so the purpose of this committee, committee is to facilitate the sharing of critical information, resources and expertise when it comes to addressing um, critical plant pests that are affecting Ontario. Um, under this council, we can also um, form technical advisory committees um, to address emerging critical plant pest issues. So under this, um, there was an Oakville Technical Advisory Committee that was established um, and they coordinate ongoing information sharing and actions to in support of Oakville preparedness and response in Canada. And so they work together to facilitate and support research advancements, recommend or recommend outreach, education, and communication strategies to increase oak wilt awareness. There were representatives from CFIA, um, MNRF, um, Canadian Forest Services, OMAFRA, and I'm showing a picture of Jen Llewellyn here, who was our rep on that um, TAC. She's our OMAFRA nursery and landscape specialist. Um, there's also reps from the Invasive Species Centre, um, the Qu Quebec Ministry of Forestry, um, City of Toronto, or Windsor, um, oops, <laughs> uh, New York Department of Environment and Conservation, and the Michigan Department of Natural Resources. So there, it was quite a diverse group. 
and they work together to produce this Oak Wilt um, response framework, which you can find on the CFIA website. <clears throat> and it outlines comprehensive measures that um, may be implemented in the event of an Oak Wilt incursion in Canada. So there's been previous webinars on Oak Wilt, so I'm not going to go into any great detail on that, but just in case you did miss um, some of those webinars, um, Oak wilt is a um, very important disease. Um, it's not here in Ontario yet, which is great news. Um, it's caused by a fungal pathogen on um, Brazilia bagacerum. Hopefully I pronounced that correctly. Uh, it was first detected in the US in the 1900s and then in the 70s in Michigan, and it is now found in 24 states. And so it's in pretty close proximity to Windsor. It's just across the Detroit River, so it's um, yeah, so we're a little worried about that. Um, it is transmitted by root grafts and um, beetle vectors. And it is an infection of the xylem. So you'll see canopy dieback, leaf drop, <clears throat> branch death, and it can lead to tree death. So I just wanted to highlight one of the projects that we're helping out with. Um, so Dr. Sharon Reed is the project lead for this. And she's looking at flight behavior, degree day modeling, and um, identification of um, sap beetles, natidulid <laughs> beetle vectors of oak wilt in southern Ontario. She's also work, uh, looking at northern Ontario as well, but um, Jennifer Llewellyn and Hannah Fraser here, I'm showing a picture of her. She's our OMAFRA entomologist for horticulture crops. Um, both, of the, both of them are helping out sharing with these efforts in um, the southern Ontario region. And this is a slide that um, Jen Llewellyn presented at Landscape Ontario's 2021 IPM Symposium, um, where she's educating on when not to prune. Um, so May and June are peak um, times for sap beetle vector activity. So it's best to avoid um, pruning during these times as they're attracted to the fresh wounds and they can come in contact with the fungus and spread it further. So Jen's encouraging people to do winter pruning, so before March 15th. So to jump to another invasive um, insect pest or um, another invasive pest issue that we're involved with, um, box tree moth. Um, and it's been a really great collaborative effort with a lot of other organizations. Um, so box tree moth, it's a serious pest of boxwood, which is in the genus um, Boxus. And box tree moth, um, this insect is native to Eastern Asia, and it was first detected in Etobicoke in August um, 2018 by citizen scientists. And I'm showing here um, a posting on iNaturalist. And then later on, CFIA um, followed up and did some scouting to confirm that there was a larval um, population in that region, and that occurred in November 2018. So this marks the first find of this insect pest in North America. So the great news is, is that we've had no reports of oxtree moth in our commercial nursery production, um, but boxwood, it is an important nursery crop. And you also find this ornamental shrub in um, various gardens and parks across North America. So finding it in Toronto, it is a big concern. Um, it currently is not um, regulated for in Canada, but it is regulated for um, this pest in the United States. And our growers do export some boxwood to the United States. So there is a bit of a concern from a trade standpoint, as well as a potential um, pest management concern to our growers if it does find its way into our commercial production, which I hope it doesn't. <laughs> so shortly after um, the fine for box tree moth in Toronto area, um, a technical advisory committee was formed and there was membership from CFIA who's leading this effort and um, also um, the Invasive Species Center and the Canadian Nursery Landscape Association, CNLA, um, um, our representatives. We also have an Ontario grower and City of Ontario or City of Toronto and um, OMAFRA sitting on this tack. And the focus of this is to share and gather information and to determine the best um, path forward, such as like survey design and education and reach efforts. So as I mentioned before, it's been a really great collaborative effort by all partners. Um, after the detection of box tree moths, um, CFIA and OMAFRA that developed a monitoring, outreach, and education research project in 2019. 
and then Landscape Ontario and CNLA um, with the support of City of Toronto and University of Toronto. Um, they assembled a <clears throat> field scouting and treatment program and um, Landscape Ontario hired scouts to monitor for BTM in Etobicoke and GTA. OMAFRA and CFI hired a student through the Master of Forest Conservation Internship Program in cooperation um, with the University of Toronto, um, supervised by Dr. Sandy Smith. And in 2020, the research project, was, um, the goal was expanded um, to the, develop a sustainable IPM program for um, box tree moth. So focusing on the biology, life cycle, and degree day requirements in Southern Ontario. And that is a collaborative effort that's led by the University of Guelph and with all the other um, collaborators that I mentioned previously. Also through um, the minor use program, um, OMAFRA secured registrations for three biopesticides that are used for larval management of box tree moth that contain Bacillus um, thuringiensis and the tree names are Dipel, Bioprotect and um, Zentari. So this is just a picture of the box tree moth adult um, showing the wing pattern and there's two generations of the adult in Ontario. It overwinters as a larva in a wet, webby um, hibernarium. The early instar larva have small heads and they tend to eat on um, one side of the leaf only. So you can see um, on the underside of the leaf here that's been eaten. And then as they get bigger, the late in star larva, um, they can do more extensive damage. So only the leaf margins will remain. And then you'll also see frass and a lot of webbing. But um, if you see webbing, it doesn't necessarily mean it's from box tree moth because um, spiders um, do also <laughs> cause some webbing and boxwood. So you have to look a little closer for other signs of um, box tree moth. And through the citizen science engagement program, there were 85 milk curtain style traps with pheromones put up and monitored weekly for adult box tree moth in 2020. And so far we've only found um, box tree moth adults in Toronto. And as mentioned earlier, these um, sites were scouted as well. And this map shows monitoring data for box tree moth in 2020. So the positive finds have expanded slightly a little bit north and then along the shore going eastward, but not too far yet, which is good. So now to switch gears to another um, insect pest, um, Western bean cutworm. So this is a pest that is native to North America, but it's not native to Ontario. It's been a long-term resident of the U.S. Great Plains region until it began to expand its range eastward and was detected in Ontario in 2008 and it can cause significant damage to dry beans and corn. So this map shows the historical distribution of Western bean cutworm in gray, and then the range expansion of this insect since um, 2000. And this is a more detailed expansion of the Western bean cutworm distribution into the Eastern Corn Belt <clears throat> between 2000 and 2017. So the ideal situation made Western bean cutworm flourish here in the um, Great Lakes region. We have two host crops, corn and dry beans. We have a long moth flight period, um, June until late August, and we have ideal conditions for the pest. So mild winters, high humidity during egg hatch, which is also great for ear mold development too. And the wounds from that Western bean cutworm can cause, um, can also cause entry point for secondary infections. Um, so it's more of a quality issue. Um, there are some mycotoxin concerns and um, it really can affect the quality of the dry beans, which is um, a big concern. So we're starting, uh, we started traveling for West Bean cutworm in the Great Lakes region in 2006. Um, it was captured in Michigan in 2006, then in Ontario in 20, 2008. Um, we established a network um, with Michigan, Ontario, and Quebec, and our OMAFRA GIS group was in, would develop static maps for each region. So by 2016, we moved to an online interactive mapping system, and that was run through our OMAFRA GIS. And then it expanded to include more pest crops and jurisdictions and became the Great Lakes and Maritime Pest Monitoring Network in 2019. 
So we have 1,618 traps put up in 2020, and we had real-time mapping and a dashboard to show weekly trap um, results. And we included more pests, um, black cutworm, corn earworm, European corn borer, fallen true armyworm, and western bean cutworm. And we're also monitoring more crops, as I mentioned, on field and sweet corn, dry beans, and other crops such as hemp, cannabis, hops, soybeans, and forages. So trap site information and math, moth catch data is um, co collected via the survey 123 for ArcGIS. And then that data is then mapped in real time throughout the season. And there's a map for each pest being monitored and you can progress through each week to see how moth catches change over time. The network, the network also has a dashboard that visualizes the data <clears throat> in grass by pest. And I've shown a picture here of Tracy Bowdy, who's our field crop entomologist, who's been heavily involved with this initiative. And just some a graph that Tracy's um, created. And we also utilize Twitter to engage growers and crop scouts and observe what they are seeing in field and produce them with timely information based on the trapping results. And so that's it for me. Sorry, I hope I didn't go over too far. <laughs> That's great. Thanks so much, Denise. So now we have some time for some questions. Uh, just a reminder to put the questions into the side panel uh, where you see questions, and we can get some of those answered. I'm going to invite uh, the rest of the panel to join uh, the question period as well. Um, and I think we'll, we'll kick it off with some initial ones that came in. Uh, so the first question is going to be directed to you, Colin. Um, are there key species that we know came from ballast waterships and are now concerns in Ontario? Um, yes, yeah, yes, there are. Um, so if you have a look at the um, Great Lakes Aquatic Nuisance uh, Species Information System, you can identify a number of species that are thought to have come in through ballast water. Um, the big one, of course, is uh, are the Dresinid mussels, um, which are thought to have come in uh, uh, through ballast water. Probably there's a chance they might have come in through biofouling um, attached to the hull of the vessels, but um, uh, you know, ballast water is the other plausible um, uh, vector for them. Uh, another good example would be the spiny water flea, uh, Bithotrephes, uh, that came in. Um, the uh, bloody red shrimp would be another good example uh, of a species that has come in uh, linked to ballast water. Um, I want to say that the rough uh, is a species that has, um, uh, you know, significant economic impacts in the Great Lakes Basin. Uh, that has also come in through ballast water. And um, so these are just a few of the species that we think have been introduced through ballast water. And of course, since 2006, we've had ballast water exchange regulations to uh, to limit the number of new introductions into the basin. And that has been relatively successful um, uh, as well. Um, uh, but the issue is, of course, once you get a new species, whether it came in through ballast water or it came in through some other vector, uh, you've got this network of vessels that are, are spreading the species within the domestic environment. And that is why uh, we're looking to regulate um, uh, the ballast water of domestic ships as well as international vessels. Great, thanks so much. Uh, this question is for all panelists. Is there a role that the public can play in help supporting your work? Denise, if you want to go first, we can go around. Sure. Well, just with the box tree moth example, and even with spotted lanternfly that we are concerned about um, entry into Ontario because that is um, found right now in New York, and it's a showy insect. That's where citizen scientists and like the general public can really help us out with um, finding, um, with the early detection of these new pest issues. So we did have a scare last year where um, it was, um, someone who I think posted to Reddit um, that they had found um, a weird looking bug <laughs> and, and we thought it would, the person was from Mississauga, but the photo was actually taken in New Jersey and it was spotted lanternfly nymph. And we were like, oh my gosh, <laughs> like it was a, a big scare. So for certain insects like that, they can really be helpful with early detection. Great. So I'll, I'll jump in. So from MTO's perspective, you know, for, 
Craig Mighty's, um, I guess it's, you know, supporting treatment on properties adjacent, uh, really in terms of, um, I guess, other invasive plants that can be harmful. So like wild parsnip, it, you know, sightings within the highway right of way, some of those nastier ones for, you know, for, for maintenance people working out there, um, reporting those types in so that they can get treated as soon as possible is, is where we look to our yeah. citizen support. Yeah, I guess on ballast water, it's a little bit different because we're, uh, we're sort of a vector um, based uh, issue rather than a species based issue. So um, working on a vector based issue like like shipping, um, it's a little bit more difficult for the public to get directly involved in the in the topic area because you're just not there on ships and working on on the ballast water um, uh, angle. Uh, but what I would say is that um, speaking from the perspective of a policy person, it is important for us to know where the areas of concern are and what people are worried about. So um, if there is a focus on invasive species, I think it's also about making sure that um, that the government, frankly, is aware of, of your concerns as a member of the public and that um, uh, that this is an issue that you you uh, you feel requires further attention. Of course, as a public servant, we hope that we're um, that we're making good choices and that we're appropriately balancing the various factors that we all have to take into account when we do policy work. Um, but part of that is understanding what are the concerns um, uh, in society more broadly. So uh, participating in those discussions, I think, is helpful from that perspective. Thank you, everyone. Uh, we had a question come in for Kathy. It's Fragmites. Based on treatment with herbicides, do you have removal advice for landowners that is effective, so outside of those herbicide treating applications? For example, hand removal or burning of plants? Um, uh, I, I guess those are other methods, um, and certainly there's a lot of material available for groups, uh, like, say through the Invasive Species Centre, um, Ontario plant groups um, in terms of management activities, uh, hand removal, much more hands on, right? Um, so you're, you have to be right in there with the plants. So for large stands, uh, not really viable, um, but for you know a, a few stocks, um, burning uh, also problematic, right? Uh, just because of the risks associated with that um, and, and the conditions that you have to do it. Um, um, but I encourage, you know, if someone's looking for alternatives to reach out to some of the groups that are available that you can find and find out what methods they use. Certainly lots of, of good advice and practical experiences out there. Hey, thanks so much, Kathy. Uh, another question that came in uh, is for Denise. Is there outreach to large nurseries happening to raise awareness of box tree moth? Yes, Jen Llewellyn, our OMAFRA um, nursery and landscape specialist, she's um, been educating the growers quite a bit. And we do have um, the industry organizations involved as well and, and growers. And she posts a lot of information on um, their website as well, like Landscape Ontario. So we're always educating our growers <laughs> whenever we can. Great, thanks so much, Denise. And um, we also just wanted to note that uh, on Phragmites related questions tomorrow morning at 9 a.m., the session is entirely invasive Phragmites focused. So if you did have more questions about Phragmites, please tune in tomorrow morning as well. Um, and then uh, the last question that we've had come in right now uh, is Will the Box Tree Moth Pheromone Traps program be repeated for 2021? Yes. And I should have mentioned that if you are interested in hosting a, a trap and you're outside of that um, GTA area and even extending into that Niagara region and are willing to do weekly reports um, to us, um, we're quite willing to um, provide a trap. So they can contact me if they're interested. So yeah, this is okay. a really big concern for us. Great. Thanks so much, everyone. And I think that's a, a kind of a great segue into this afternoon's session. Um, at first, I just want to thank our speakers so much for coming and, and presenting today um, and for everyone who joined us today. Um, 
we're going to go into break as there's no more questions coming into the question box, but I wanted to flag the next session that we are having at 1 p.m. today is titled Early Detection and Rapid Response to Emerging Threats, and there's going to be a great community action focus as well, so I think that's a nice segue into today's uh, afternoon session. So that starts today at 1 p.m. I just want to again thank the speakers so much for joining us today, and we'll see everyone again at 1 p.m. today. Thanks so much. Great, thank you. Thank you.